Amen. Our topic this morning is righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. And I want to make it practical. How I received righteousness by faith. How you can receive righteousness by faith. Let's go to Second Chronicles. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians. Where are we going to? Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Our topic is righteousness by faith. We're going to the book of Second Corinthians chapter 11. And notice what the Bible says in verse number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and notice what the Bible says in verse number 2. Are you with me? All right. We're going to do a simple study this morning, a very simple study. This is a very simple message, and it should be, amen? If someone wants to understand how they, be, can, how they can come to Christ, there should be simple understanding, a simple message of how to do it. And the Bible tells us that the gospel should be presented in a simple manner, amen? Notice what it says, 2 Chronicles, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Are we there? All right. The Bible says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtility, that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? In Christ. So the Bible teaches that the gospel should be presented in its simplicity. The gospel should be simple, amen? And this morning we're going to understand righteousness by faith. I'm going to, I want to make it so simple by the grace of God that all of us can be able to understand it and also apply it to our life, amen? A simple understanding. The gospel should be simple. Let's go now to our scripture reading. Romans chapter 1 verse uh, 16 and 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the simplicity of Christ, the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Salvation. Salvation from sin, amen? Salvation from sin. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, in the gospel, in Christ, in the gospel, is what? The righteousness of God. Revealed from what? Faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. So the Bible teaches that in the gospel, we should find the righteousness of God. Amen? So in the gospel, we can find righteousness by faith. Now we need to understand what is righteousness. Amen? For if the gospel has righteousness, we need to ask ourselves the question now, what is righteousness? Amen? And let's let the Bible answer that. Let's let the Bible answer that. What is righteousness? I'm going to look at our first scripture, Psalms 119, verse 172. It's on the screen for you. It says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments. All what? All the commandments are righteousness. So the Bible says the Ten Commandments are God's what? Righteousness. So the Bible teaches that the gospel has the Ten Commandments at the seat of it. Does that make sense? There are a lot of people, a lot of preachers, a lot of pastors, a lot of churches that are saying that we want the gospel. Preach the gospel. But the Ten Commandments, they're done away with. Have you heard that before? The Ten Commandments, they're nailed to the cross. The Ten Commandments, we don't have to keep them anymore. But the Bible does not teach that. The Bible t says, thy, My tongue shall speak of thy word, and all thy commandments are righteousness. We saw in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For in the gospel we find the righteousness of God. So in the gospel we should find the commandments of God. Does that make sense? So every commandment we see here, these Ten Commandments are not nailed to the cross. These Ten Commandments are the righteousness of God. Are, are you still with me? All right. So we saw in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the, the, the gospel has the righteousness of God. We saw that the righteousness of God are the Ten Commandments, Psalms 119, verse 172. And the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20. Notice what the Bible says in verse 2. Are we there? Are you with me? All right, let's look at it briefly. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make no... Make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Let's skip down to verse 7. Are you with me? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Amen. Number, the, the fourth commandment, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to do what? 
Is the seventh day Sabbath still applicable today? The righteousness of God, amen? It says in verse 9, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So remember, the Ten Commandments are the righteousness of God. So in the gospel, we should find the commandments of God. We should find the seventh day Sabbath, amen? Preaching the gospel does not exclude it, it includes it, amen? In verse number 12, we see the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 13, uh, verse 13, commandment number 6, thou shalt not what? Kill. Kill. Number 7, verse 14, thou shalt not do what? Commit adultery. Number 8, thou shalt not do what? Steal. Number 9, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And verse number ten, uh, 17, number 10, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. So when the Bible says that all the commandments of God are righteousness, we would find the Ten Commandments are the righteousness of God. Does that make sense? So we cannot say we have righteousness by faith and we're breaking the commandments. Amen? The righteousness of God are the commandments of God. You may say, well, that's one scripture. Psalms 119, 172. Well, here's another scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 25. It says, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. So the Bible says it is for our righteousness if we do what? Keep the commandments of God. Does that make sense? Do we have two witnesses? Amen? At the sound of two witnesses, the thing shall be what? Established. So we have two witnesses that the commandments of God are his righteousness. And there are many people saying that the commandments of God don't need to be kept. A lot of people are saying that. But didn't the Bible say in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 21, you could take this for your notes. Isaiah 42, verse 21, it says, magnify the law, make it honorable. To magnify something, is that to downplay it or is that to ex exalt it? Amen? So to magnify it, make it honorable. Jesus said, I am not come to destroy the law, but to do what? Fulfill. fulfill. Jesus came in Matthew 5, verse 17, verse 18, to fulfill the commandments, to keep the commandments, not to break them. Amen? And the Bible says, and Psalms 119, let's go there for a moment. Psalms 119, that in these last days, that Jesus is going to do a work because many people are breaking the commandments of God. We're going to Psalms 119. I just want us to see this from the Word of God. Amen? Are you still with me? All right. We're going to, in our Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalms 119. And notice what the Bible says here in, the, in, the, in, the, in your Bible. Psalms 119. And notice what the Bible says in verse 126. Are we there? Psalms 119, verse 26. It says, it is time for thee, O Lord, to do what? Are you with me? It's quiet. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. And so the Bible says that when people are making void God's law, saying we don't need to keep it anymore, God is going to come and do a special work of exalting, of uplifting the law of God. And doesn't he have a remnant people? that keep the commandments of God, Revelation 12, verse 17. And so we must exalt the law of God. So in the gospel, Romans 1, 16, let's look at it one more time. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This is the gospel that saves our soul to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Therein is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the gospel that saves our soul is the gospel that has the law of God inside. If you hear a gospel that does not have the righteousness of God inside, that gospel cannot save our soul. Does that make sense? It can't save our soul. And there are many preachers preaching another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel unto you, then that which was preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he, and he said before, so say I now again, that if any man preach another gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. He repeats it twice, saying that if you hear another gospel, saying that we don't have to keep God's law, let that person, let that church, let that group be accursed. Galatians 1, verse 8 and verse 9. The Bible says there's a specific gospel that must be preached in all the world. And then shall the end come, the three angels' message, the gospel that uplifts the character of God, the law of God, the judgment of God, whereby we're going to be judged by the law. Notice what it says, Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And what will happen? 
then shall the end come. Now, when you think about this gospel, it's going to be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Now, can you have a king? Can you have a kingdom without a king? No, you need a king to be in a kingdom, right? And can you have a king in a kingdom without a government? You need a government, right? And can you have a government without rules and laws? Right? And so there is a law. There is a commandment. We have a, a, a king. Jesus is the king of kings, the Bible says in Revelation 19. King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus has laws whereby he wants us to abide, and it's a part of this gospel. So again, let's look at it one more time. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, in this gospel, is the righteousness, the law of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, how do we receive this righteousness of God? Because we know that we, we are not saved by keeping the law. Does that make sense? If you read Romans chapter 3, the Bible says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. If you read James chapter 1, the Bible says that the law is a mirror. It shows us our sins. Amen. So we're not saved by keeping the law. We need this righteousness, but how can we receive it? Notice what the Bible says. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So we must first come in contact with what? The gospel. We must first come in contact with the gospel. And we must come in contact with the love of God for us. Amen? That is the gospel. Notice this. Because it is the love of God that fulfills the law. Romans chapter 13, verse 10, it says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, Therefore, love is what? The fulfilling of the law. So the Bible says that love fulfills the law. So if I want to keep the righteousness of God or the law of God, I need the love of God in my soul so I can keep the law of God. Make sense? I need God's love. We need God's love. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? So the, the driving point to keep God's law is his love. Galatians 5, verse 6 says, by, it is a faith that works by love. Amen? So we need a faith that works by love. We need to receive the love of Christ into the soul by receiving Jesus on Calvary, by meditating upon him. 1 John 3, verse 5, verse 3. It says, For this is the what? The love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So before we can keep the commandments, which are the righteousness of God, we need the love of God. Does that make sense? This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Are you still with me this morning? All right. First John 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. So we can't keep the commandments or walk in obedience to him in love unless we first love him. Amen? Now, I want us to see something. Steps to Christ, page 35. And this, was make, this is what makes the message so practical. Steps to Christ, page 35. It says, all his promises. How many? All. all his promises. His warnings are but the breathing of unutterable love. Did you get that? Every promise that you find in this book is God's love for you. Did you get that? Every verse in this Bible is God's love for you. It's a promise. Amen? Amen. So when we read the Ten Commandments and we're seeing, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me, God is saying that if you accept this promise, you will have no other gods before me. If you accept this promise, you will not commit adultery against me. If you receive this promise, you will not bear false witness against me. If you receive this promise, I promise I will keep you so that you will not break the Sabbath. Amen? All the promises of God and all of his warnings are but the breathing of what? Unutterable love. So how do we receive the love of God to keep his righteousness, I need to look for the promises. Amen? That makes sense? I need to look for the promises. And there are many promises in, in God's word. So when we go back to those other scriptures, now it makes sense. When it says we love him because he first loved us, his love is what? His lo all his promises and warnings are the breathing of unutterable love. So when it says we love him because he first loved us, he gave us these precious promises whereby as we read these promises, now we have the strength to love him. Amen? That makes sense? It's about a loving relationship with God. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. We see his promises. This is the promises of God. All his warnings, all his promises are the, the breathing of unutterable love. It says as we look at the promises of God, we can keep his commandments. 
So it is a faith that works by his promises. Does that make sense? Because his promises are his love. So God promises righteousness as a gift towards us. Amen? We can claim this promise. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace. And is grace also a gift? Ephesians chapter five, uh, 2, verse 8, amen? It says, And the gift of righteousness shall reign in, in life by one, Jesus Christ. So righteousness is given to all of us as a gift, as a promise, amen? As a promise. Jeremiah 23, verse 6, it says, And in his days shall Judah be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and his name, shall, his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So we can claim these promises. Lord, you are my righteousness. Your promises are my righteousness. Your salvation is my righteousness. I'm trusting in your word and not in my works. Amen? And as we trust in God's word, there are many promises in the Bible whereby, whereby we, which we can claim the righteousness of God. How are we to receive this righteousness? Notice it says, Romans 1, verse 16, 17, one more time. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We need to believe in these promises. To the Jew first and also to the, the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? Faith to faith. So how do we receive these promises? By faith. Now what is faith? Hebrews 1, 11, verse 16. I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the what? substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So do we all hope for the righteousness of Christ? Do we all hope to be saved from sin? Do we all hope for perfection of character? We hope for these things, but where do we hope for them? In his word, amen? Because Romans 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. My faith is being based upon whatever God says in his word. The evidence of things not seen. I may not see God change my heart. I may not see God change my mind or my life. I may not see God take away my sins or take away the filth or take away the guilt. I may not even feel it sometimes. But if God says it in his word, I can base my hope upon his word because the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for evidence of things not seen, and the scriptures give us this hope. Does that make sense? So we base our faith not upon your feeling. Amen? Amen. Have you ever get on your knees to pray, and you feel so guilty because of a sin, and you rise up, and you don't feel any different, and the devil plays with your mind saying, Jesus has not accepted your confession? But we don't base our faith upon our feelings, we base it upon the, the Word of God. The Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. So faith comes by what? hearing and hearing by the word of God. If Jesus said it, that settles it. You can believe it. Amen. We can believe the word of God. How necessary is our faith? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I, I'm going to show you this. Hebrews chapter 11. How necessary is our faith? How necessary it is to have faith in God? You know, the Bible says that without faith, what does it say? It's, in, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, we have it right here. In verse 6, the Bible says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We can't live a life that is pleasing to God without faith. We can't live a life that pleases God without faith. We need to come to God in faith. And what is faith? Taking the Word of God and basing your hope upon what He says and claiming what the Bible says to be true. Whatever God says, you believe it. That is faith. Amen? Whatever God says. Can God, can God lie? If there's promises, they're for us. Amen? And so faith, it, without faith, is, it is impossible to please God. But there's a difference between faith and unbelief. I'm sorry. There's a difference between faith and belief. Are you with me? The devils also believe and tremble. James 2 verse 19. Amen? The devils don't have faith. So what's the difference between believing and faith? We're going to find it right here in the same verse. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Let's read the whole verse now. So the Bible says, but without faith it is what? Impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, does the devil come to God? No. No, he doesn't. He that cometh to God must believe. Does the devil believe in God for a pardoning Savior, for a redeeming Savior, for a high priest, 
No, he doesn't, right? It goes on to say, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that do what? Diligently seek him. So the difference between faith and belief is faith diligently seeks God. And as you diligently seek God, you believe that whatever God said, he's going to do. That's what faith is. Amen? If anyone could believe in something, but faith is you're saying, Lord, I'm diligently seeking you. I need a promise from your word. I need forgiveness of sin. I need restoration. I need to be cleansed. I need to be redeemed. And you're diligently seeking his word to find a promise. And then you stand upon the promises of God. Amen? That's what faith is. Faith is diligently seeking God. Does Satan do that? He doesn't come to God for that reason, right? And so this is what faith is. And God wants us to receive this faith. And here are some of the promises I put in this message so that we can claim by God's grace to receive this righteousness by faith. Believing and receiving by diligently seeking these promises. 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, If we do what? Confess our sins. He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive our sins and to cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. Now when all unrighteousness is gone, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, what is left? Righteousness. But whose righteousness? Because we have none. We just confess ours. Or our unrighteousness. So he supplies his righteousness because we believe his promise. That makes sense? Amen. And this is what we need to do. We need to believe that God cleanses us from all. A lot of people think that when they come to Christ, you know, they have to work on this and work on that and change this and change that. You come to God just as you are. He cleanses you from all. At that moment, you're clean before God. Amen? Amen? Before you have a knowledge of the health message, before you have a knowledge of dress reform, before you have a knowledge, He cleanses you. And then as you begin to understand more truth, then you walk in sanctification. Amen? But from this moment, if you confess your sin, the sins that you know, you become justified before God as if you never sinned. Amen? That's the message of righteousness by faith. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it says, Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them his sin shall have what? Shall have mercy. So we need to claim these promises. Lord, I want to leave my sin behind. I confess them and I put them before your feet. Don't let the devil beat you over the head and tell you that God is not a great God to pardon your sin. Amen? Leave it there at the feet of Jesus. Psalm 32, verse 5. I love this. It says, I acknowledge my sin. That's what we need to do while Christ is in the most holy place of the sanctuary. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. Mine iniquity have I not hid. If we hide our sins, we're not going to prosper. Amen? He says, my, Mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, for thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And that word selah means think about it. You know, sometimes we need to think. Sit down and think about how God forgave you of your sin. Past tense. Amen? Don't think about if, if God forgave you of your sin. Think about God forgiving you of your sin. Amen? That's what the Bible says. And it will strengthen your faith. Amen? In his promises. Psalms 86 verse 5. Thou for thou, Lord, art good. And he's what? Ready to forgive. Sometimes we sin and we're like, God, Lord, please. We're crying, begging, begging, begging. Jesus is already ready before we even sinned. He's ready to do what? Ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. Amen? So brothers and sisters, we can receive his forgiveness right now. Isaiah 55 verse 7, it says, Let the wicked do what? Forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, for he will have what? Mercy upon him, and to our God he will abundantly pardon. We can claim these promises, amen, every single day as we're seeking the Lord. Micah 7, verse 8, 18, it says, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, that passeth by transgression? I like that because I, in, in Exodus chapter 34, you know, God said to Moses, I will pass by you. And he showed him his mercy and his goodness and his grace, amen? So when it says, I will pass by transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he retained it not his anger how long? He doesn't retain it forever because he delights in what? He delights in mercy. See, our heart beats wickedness. Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. No man is safe for a day or an hour without prayer, great controversy says. We are wicked by nature. But Christ's heart, it beats love. It beats forgiveness. It beats mercy. He wants to forgive us, amen? 
but he won't force our will. We need to come to him. And this is what it means to receive this righteousness by faith. Numbers 4, verse 19 and 20. I love this. Numbers 4, 19 and 20. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt until now, 2018. Are you still with me? From all the way then until now, he's still able to do it. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to what? Thy word. So God pardons according to the word. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we can claim this promise today. Amen. Isaiah 38, verse 17. I love this. It says, Behold, I, I, for peace, behold, for peace, I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. Thou hast called, thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. You know, God wants to, he sees our sin, he wants to turn around and not even look at it anymore. Amen? Cast all our sins behind his back. That's the God that we serve. Amen? That's the God that we serve. Hosea 14, verse 4, it says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. God says, I want to love you freely. I want to love you freely. I want to wrap my arms around you. I, God says, I want to heal all your backsliding. Can you imagine a God like this? This is the God that we serve. Remember the prodigal son? Let's go there. Luke chapter 15. There's something I want to bring out here. Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son, he left his father's house. He wasted his time in sin. And you know what? He wasted his time. He wasted his money. He wasted his life. He wasted his substance on the world. But like my brother brought out this morning, we are stewards. So guess what? He wasted God's time. He wasted God's money. He wasted God's substance on the things of this world. And the things that we have given, God has given to us, many people are wasting it. Their time, their money, wasting time, doing things of the world. But notice the love of God toward this prodigal. There's something I want to show, show us here. Luke chapter 15, are we there? The Bible says, let's look at verse 11. It says, and he said, a certain man had how many? Two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto him his living. And verse 13, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country. He premeditated this, premeditated sin. He gathered his, his, his substance and thought, I'm going to go far away. It says he went into a far country and there wasted his substance with what? Riotous living. He spent his money on harlots. He spent his money on entertainment. He spent his money on uh, events that God was not connected to, had no desire, wanted to be disconnected from his father. And the Bible says in verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Doesn't it seem that every time we spend time in the world, or every time we see the devil making sin look so beautiful, and then it comes to an end, you see that there's a famine? You feel empty inside? Every time we give in to sin, we feel more emptier than when we did not give in to that sin. Do you feel that way? Every time. Because the Bible says that he, who that drinks of this water, they're going to thirst again. But he that drinks of this living water shall what? Never thirst. And every time we thirst from the world and go after what the world has, we get more emptier, we feel more dirty, we feel more lost. Notice his condition. He sends his need. In verse 15, it says this. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into, the fields, uh, to, and into his fields to feed swine. I want us to understand. He joined himself to the citizen of the country. M many of us, when we sin, we join ourselves to Satan. We join ourselves to Satan. We become one with the devil. And the Bible says, he sent him to, to feed the swine. You know, when we leave Jesus, there's nothing else to do but feed the swine. There's nothing else to do but hang with pigs. Nothing else to do but be unclean. Are you with me? He had no righteousness, completely lost. The Bible says in verse number 16, are you with me? It says, and he would feign and filled his belly with the husk that his swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. So he was eating pig's food. Why? Because he wasn't spending time in the Word. You know, if we don't spend time in the Word, we end up eating what the pigs are eating. We end up listening to the, what the, the music that the pigs are listening to. 
We end up dressing the way the pigs are dressing. Unclean. Are you with me? Because we're not spending time in the Word. And he noticed that there was a difference in his life from the time he left the father's house until now. And notice what the Bible says in verse number 17. It says, And when he came to himself, how many hired servants, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spear and I perish with hunger? He was thinking about how in his father's house there was bread. What does bread represent in the Bible? The Word of God. Give us this day our daily bread. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He was thinking about how he was more fulfilled in the Word of God than in the world. Are you with me? He was more fulfilled. Not only that, but the bread is Jesus Christ. John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am that bread of life. Amen? So he was thinking about Jesus. He was thinking about the Word. And he said, you know what? I cannot continue living in my sin. When he came to that realization, verse 18, he says, I will arise and go to my Father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And can you imagine? He's probably thinking about all the sins he needs to confess before the Father all the things that he's done, all the time that he's wasted. But as he's thinking about all these things, immediately as the father heard the confession, he's gathered righteousness for him. Notice verse 19. It says, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. And as, as he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And then said... Then the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. He's planning all of what he's going to say. I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Notice what the father does. In verse 22, he just acts like he didn't even hear him. Verse 22, but the father said to the servants, bring forth the what? The best robe. What does the robe represent? The righteousness of Christ. As he's confessing his sin, the father says, I don't even want to hear it. I'm just glad you're home. Bring forth the best robe. Are you with me? And put, a, um, and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. I know, wonder why it, had, uh, it was such a fat calf? Because he had fat sins. Amen? <laughs> the bigger the sin, the Bible says, where sin abound, what? Grace much more abounds. Amen? And so he, he came back to the Father's house, and he was received as if he didn't even sin. And he asked for even a lower position, but the Father restored him back to the same position. Amen? It was nothing that he did. All he did was come home and confess, and the Father did the rest. Are you with me? And so righteousness by faith, you do your part. All we can do is confess. Amen? All we can do is forsake, leave the world. And Jesus does the rest. We accept his promise. We claim his promise. We believe his promise. And at this moment, we're no longer the prodigal son. We are sons and daughters of God. Are you with me? Notice this. It's by faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus doesn't want to hear how bad we have been. Are you with me? He's just happy that we came home. Confession is for us, not more so for him. Are you with me? Confession is good for our soul. Are you with me? But Jesus covers us with his righteousness. And so, brothers and sisters, today, God wants to accept us as he accepted the prodigal son. Ephesians chapter 1. I just want to read one text there. Ephesians chapter 1. We can receive this forgiveness as we accept Christ. Going to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that you can have this? Amen? Do you believe that your sins are too great to receive the righteousness of Christ? If your sins are too great to receive the righteousness of Christ, why would Jesus have this gospel and have the righteous, righteousness of God, which is his law, and knew we would break his law, and yet not have the righteousness to meet us where we are to meet the law's demands? Amen? We need to cast as Christian in Pilgrim's Progress was carrying that burden. We need to walk with the word of God and lay our burden before the feet of Jesus, amen, to receive his, this forgiveness. Are you still with me? All right, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, notice what the Bible says. We're, we're almost done. In verse 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in what? So we're, we are accepted in the beloved. 
Notice it didn't say we are accepted in our sins. Because, yes, we come to God with our sins, but your sin or your righteousness or your condition, whatever you, it may be, does not cause this acceptance. It's the beloved, it's Jesus that brings this acceptance into our life, whether we're filled with sin or just sin went once. Are you with me? It is the righteousness of Christ. All who are going to be saved are going to be saved through the merits, through the sacrifice, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? There's going to be people in heaven that should not be there. What I mean, have you read Hebrews chapter 11? Rahab, the prostitute, Samson, right? And many other people. And this is an encouragement for us so that when we see our sins, we can put our faith in Jesus, amen? We can claim the promises of God and receive the righteousness of Christ. I wish I had steps of Christ on me. I forgot it. Do we have steps of Christ here? I am in my church. Oh, it's, uh, I don't want to go outside. It's okay. But faith and acceptance, very powerful. Read that chapter, Amen. Read that chapter, Faith and Acceptance. It says that do not wait until you feel that you are cleansed. Don't wait until you feel that you are cleansed. It says believe the promise because he promised it. Amen? So just get on your knees, claim the promise, get up and move forward and know that you are cleansed because he promised. Amen? That's such a powerful, powerful, powerful book. Believe that God will do this for you. Amen? And you can receive his righteousness. So you can look at that for reference to see that those who were weak in faith became strong. Those who were ignorant became wise. Through faith in Christ, they became victorious. And God wants to make us victorious as we claim his promises. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Does God want us to overcome sin? Amen? How did Jesus overcome? It is written, amen? And that's what we must use. The promises of God. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith in his word. Amen? Our faith in his love. Our faith in his promises. And faith will cause us to work. Faith will cause us to produce righteousness through Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of what? Faith and labor of love. A lot of people like to separate Faith and works, but it's together. If you have faith in Christ, you believe he's pardoned you, now you get up by faith and you begin to walk in that obedience towards him, amen? Because he has forgiven you, because he has pardoned you, because he's cleansed you from your sins. Hebrews 11 verse 8, faith is connected with obedience. Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith, Abraham, put your name there. By faith, Akeem, Chris, Lionel, amen? By faith. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called out to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, did what? Obeyed as he went out, not knowing whether he went. So faith is connected with what? Obedience. So we cannot say, Lord, I have faith. I have faith that you are willing to do this for me if we're not willing to be obedient. Does that make sense? Almost done. We have two more scriptures, two more slides, or a few more slides. Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, Jesus connects faith with obedience. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So Jesus joined faith with obedience. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, amen? And so by faith in Christ, we can have the power to keep his commandments. And we accept Jesus Christ by faith. Amen? We, we accept Jesus Christ by faith. You must accept him by faith. It doesn't matter how sinful you are. It doesn't matter your past. God looks at that. Yes, he does look at that. But he looks at your heart. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ and receive his righteousness, today you can be accounted righteous as if you never sinned. Amen? Steps of Christ says you can be accounted righteous as if you never sinned. I think that's Steps of Christ, page 62. And when we accept Jesus Christ, one of the commands that he offers us, he tells us to do, is to be baptized. Now, the reason why I'm giving this invitation is because in connection with the gospel, righteousness by faith, there is a connection and invitation to baptism. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 16, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and do what? Preach the gospel. Did we not just study the gospel? 
and to every creature, he says, that he that believeth, it says to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. Saved. So God says, with this invitation of the gospel, of the righteousness of Christ, of receiving pardon from sin, the Bible says there's an invitation to accept him in baptism. Amen? What's the purpose of baptism? Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, it says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his what? Death. Just like the prodigal son, he left the world. I want to die to that life. I want to come back to my father. Baptism is burying that old life, amen? And resurrecting with a newness of life. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we should walk in newness of life. Amen? So God says, I want you to start over, to accept me in baptism. Matthew chapter 28. What prepares us for baptism? Bible studies. Amen? <laughs> Bible studies. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, our last scripture. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So there's an invitation that once we accept and receive Jesus Christ and his righteousness, God is now extending the invitation for Bible studies to understand his truth and for baptism. Now, I want to I ask a question. Is there anyone here that desires Bible study for the purpose of baptism.